it's, it's an important one to add to the spectrum of nuclear issues that this, <coughs> that's going on because uh, it's kind of almost like there's an elephant in the room. There, there's the um, nuclear uh, uh, submarines well, there, yeah, the polar bears, yeah, but uh, there's also uh, submarines. Anyway, we're going to see a map in a minute. And uh, the map will show you the, uh, a view from uh, looking down on the pole. And sometimes, if you haven't looked at this much, you'll think it's kind of strange. Um, uh, what, what we see is the fact that we uh, are looking at uh, nations who are, and I'll name them, Canada, uh, U.S., uh, Alaska, uh, Russia, uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway, um, Iceland, and then Greenland, which, of course, is Denmark. And the nuclear weapon-free zone is um, one uh, a treaty. Um, then it needs ratification by the affected zonal states. And then finally, we need uh, protocols by all the nuclear weapon states. And so you see a UN map uh, for, for that, and you see the names of the countries that are already in the nuclear uh, weapon-free zone. So um, we, um, <coughs> we have an opportunity here um, uh, because we've got these civilization-threatening problems, and of course you know nuclear weapons is one, but so is climate change. And what happens there is uh, we can either take this as an opportunity for exceptional cooperation or exceptional conflict. And there's a huge climate change-induced upheaval, uh, which gives us either commercial new operation, new changes in governance, which we could use to uh, springboard into uh, other ideas uh, as, as a, a model, uh, and we can also uh, take a window of opportunity. Uh, if you uh, note the ice is melting, um, there's the elephant in the room, the nuclear submarines and others, but there's still plenty of ice, and that means when this time of calm is a better time, the conflict risk is low in the Arctic at the moment, so this is the time to begin those negotiations because a nuclear weapon free zone, as everyone knows, is a long, long time to get going. So when the conflict is zero uh, or close to zero. So there's got to be um, many new agreements in the Arctic and amongst them has to string along with that is the nuclear weapon free zone idea. So um, we've got a new Arctic. We just uh, outlined very quickly that there's um, there's commercial shipping, there's uh, potential tourism, there's oil, gas, and minerals, there's commercial fishing, there's permafrost melting, uh, which makes a huge amount of infrastructure problems on, on the land, there's coastal flooding, there's food supply webs, there's human insecurity, there's massive adaptation, and uh, peoples there have to participate, and all the Arctic nations are busily increasing their military presence. So we've got tools for governance, which aren't really the right ones yet. We've got the Arctic Council, we've got science research cooperation, we've got the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is very appropriate uh, in defining territories and influences. We've got economic strategies we have to regulate, we've got agreements and treaties. So we have to set a global example for innovations in governance and uh, uh, we uh, would note that there is a, uh, an example already, which is those nations agreeing on a search and rescue agreement, and we'll come back to that a bit later, but they did that in 2011, and it's the first Arctic treaty that is truly a treaty about that, that topic, and then there have been um, other, other things like the persistent or organic pollutants and, and, other things under, and other things that are now under discussion. So the United Nations, of course, is very important uh, and, and, uh, because, well, one, in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is really important, the, um, the fact is that there is a, um, Article 7 uh, supporting nuclear weapon-free zones, and we've got a, a Ban Ki-moon's five-point proposal supporting that, uh, and we've got um, a statement from August 2012 also supporting it. And um, we can, you know, perhaps read that, but we don't want to take too much <coughs> time at the moment on that. <coughs> but in, in conclusion uh, of United Nations, 
recent actions, they, they discussed them a lot at the um, first committee meetings of 2010, and the Danish ambassador at that point said there is a renewed conviction that nuclear weapon-free zones are an integral element of a comprehensive multilateral strategy to implement global nuclear disarmament and combat proliferation. So what in fact we have to do here is connect this ideal of the Nuclear Weapons Convention, which is what uh, is really needed, outlawing nuclear weapons, totally having a nuclear weapon free world. Well, in fact, a nuclear weapons regional convention is, is just a regional <coughs> nuclear weapons convention. And uh, <coughs> learning how to make a nuclear weapons convention in one region will help in, in the uh, lessons learned that can be utilized later. So how are we going to do this? Um, well, in fact, factors affecting it are there's uh, one, there's two nuclear weapon states around there, and there's NATO agreements, and uh, there's security policies of the non-nuclear weapon states are not helpful at the moment. <coughs> there are potential steps leading to an Arctic nuclear weapon free zone. There's geographic boundaries, and there's regional measures because everyone is different. But we've got challenges. We've got U.S. and Russia are nuclear weapon states. Um, many circumpolar na nations are part of NATO, but in fact there are nuclear alliances and other nuclear weapon-free zones. Uh, the uh, uh, Australia, for instance, is, 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 is both. Um, just uh, some examples. Um, you can see uh, U.S. there with a nuclear submarine, nuclear-equipped submarine. You can see Russia with the same. Of this nuclear weapons, you can see other military uh, efforts of very recent times uh, to increase, but maybe, um, in fact, it's simply a matter of uh, supporting the activities in the Arctic. It's not maybe necessarily that it is a, an offensive uh, thing to, to do, except for the elephant in the room, the nuclear weapon uh, uh, submarines and, and other uh, uh, things. So, uh, in fact, there was a response, uh, a cold response exercise in uh, March 2012, which was not, in fact, a NATO exercise. Uh, there was um, a suggestion that there be an Arctic Coast Guard forum, this is just one of something, that maybe there needs to be some kind of cooperation, but it doesn't necessarily need to be NATO presence in the Arctic. And, uh, Russia certainly doesn't want NATO to establish in the Arctic. So I think it is very uh, important to, to try to uh, have NATO refrain from acting in the Arctic for that reason. Now, uh, militarization, there's a lot of comments there, but there's not really time to read them. But in fact, every country around the Arctic has supported cooperation, not militarization. They all say it. Now, they have to put their money where their mouth is and, and actually do that instead of uh, coming to a military situation. Now, um, what is the security policy of the non-nuclear weapons free state? Well, in fact, the fact is that the, there is now one of those states, that is Denmark, that has a nuclear weapon free zone in its foreign policy, which is very interesting. And except for US and Russia, of course, the those circumpolar states have already fulfilled the important criteria for that. For that. Let's see. Yeah. Well, so the government of Denmark uh, has made their foreign, foreign policy statement, which says, um, in, in dialogue with uh, Denmark's partners, the government will pursue the proposal of making the Arctic region the nuclear weapon free zone. And um, in the general uh, debate of the first committee, they mentioned Denmark should explore and we should explore how to establish nuclear weapon free zones, including the Middle East and in the Arctic. You know, sort of lumping them together as things to work on. Then the uh, non proliferation and disarmament initiative, uh, which met in uh, just recent times, also supported it. Uh, so, uh, there, there's support arising 
uh, in many ways. And then there's that in June 2010, um, the government of Canada has uh, had a resolution passed in both its Senate and House of Commons about the Nuclear Weapons Convention. And there have been some Arctic nuclear weapon free zone initiatives by MPs in the House of Commons, but they have not, they have not um, made any obligation on the government because that is not the way these, these motions go. They just get passed unanimously and the government can do whatever they want, which at the moment the Canadian government doesn't want to do anything. They need pressure from their other circumpolar uh, colleagues to do it. And of course, the indigenous populations of the Arctic are interesting. There is the Inuit Circumpolar Council, which has, in 1986, passed a, a resolution for a nuclear-free Arctic. They had suffered plenty through the Cold War, and they knew they didn't want any more of it. So they need to really be helped to renew that resolution in spite of all the many things that the Inuit Circumpolar Council has to still do. But um, if we look at um, geographic boundaries, you can see that there maybe it could be the Arctic Circle, which you see on the, the one map. Uh, but in fact, the search and rescue agreement is very interesting because it has, um, it has very well defined boundaries. Uh, and it's already the subject of an international agreement, and it's already known exactly what geography that is. So that would be a, a possibly better region to, to, to use. And so on with that. Um, so if we then uh, the start to do this, we take what happens starting with Denmark and work be between just the non-nuclear weapon states uh, and then uh, get a consensus there. Uh, I, I did speak to someone that you know very well, Sergio Duarte, and he suggested that this is the right way to get uh, progress on this. You get the circumpolar states acting together, do not approach Russia, do not approach the U.S., until they are together and they want a treaty on the nuclear weapon free zone, and then, they, then you can go forward uh, to approach the U.S. and Russia. So you can have uh, land, or you can have surface waters, or you can have territorial waters, and you can also have, as other nuclear weapons free zones have, innocent transit of submarines for a while, or maybe for a long while. And so um, the end move uh, could be uh, UN First Committee, resolution in the General Assembly, you could have non-nuclear weapon uh, states, a united approach, US and Russia, and that, that would be an interesting illustration and use of uh, US and Russia's uh, ability to reduce nuclear weapons if they reduce them in the Arctic. And we are aware that there are extreme difficulties there, but nevertheless, it, it's possible to uh, make that a confidence measure for entire nuclear disarmament. And so the proposal that we should continue to press the circumpolar governments to act on their New Northern vision of peace and work with the non-nuclear weapon states until they're all actively engaged in this. And so, um